Welcome, everyone. Welcome. Wonderful to see you all here, faculty, administrators, students, board members, friends, and guests. Uh, this is a, a great day. This is one of the most important days of the academic year. Um, for the new students, obviously, it's the beginning, um, the beginning of, a, of an intellectual and social and emotional adventure uh, that you're embarking on for the returning students. It's a midpoint. Uh, it's a time to reflect on, on where you've been and where you're going, and of course, to uh, welcome all the new students into the Fletcher family. Um, for the school as a whole, of course, it's an especially poignant new beginning because very soon, not yet, uh, we are going to have a new dean, Rachel Kite. <laughs> um, she, every year, uh, I, I guess some of you know, but maybe some don't, we ask a distinguished alum to come and speak to the class and give a convocation address. And this year, we didn't have to look very far. And so uh, soon, soon to be Dean Rachel Kite is not here only as your future dean, our future dean, but also as a graduate of the Fletcher School who's had a really extraordinary career. Um, as you all know, she's currently the special representative of the UN Secretary General for Sustainable Development for All, and she's working very closely with Secretary General Guterres and various key governments on the Global Climate Action Summit, which is coming up on September 23rd. Um, so for us, um, your, your presence is a double pleasure. Um, we get to, to meet our new dean, but we also get to hear you reflect on leadership and how you got to the pinnacle of global engagement on one of the most important issues of the day. Um, and on a personal note, I am delighted <laughs> to be handing over the reins. <laughs> I, I have, while I have enjoyed every, every minute of my time as interim dean, I, uh, I know she's going to be a really superb leader for this school. Um, her background, of course, is in climate change and sustainable energy, which it touches on almost everything we do here, from protection of the environment to promotion of development to human rights to law and diplomacy and security and peace and whatnot. So she's got the kind of experience at the intergovernmental and the governmental level and the non-governmental level and the private sector uh, that means that she's going to have a lot to teach all of us. Um, Rachel, I've done my best uh, over the course of the last year not to make too big a mess, uh, but I still have three more weeks, so don't, don't hold your breath. Uh, but I can promise you that we, we, the faculty and the administrators and the board members, will do everything we can to make this new beginning as pleasant as possible for you and hopefully a little less difficult than solving the problem of climate change. Um, uh, to, to the students, to all of our students, the incoming students, but also the continuing students, as I said at orientation a week ago, you are in the right place at the right time. And these are complex and confusing days uh, with a pace of events outstripping our ability to understand them, let alone to cope with them. Um, this uncertainty, and it creates uncertainty, but this uncertainty can be unsettling, but it also creates opportunities intellectual opportunities to challenge received wisdom and to think out of the box, professional opportunities to blaze new career paths, to create new jobs or to redefine existing jobs. We, the faculty, the administrators, are going to do everything we can to prepare you to take advantage of these opportunities. And what we ask of you in return is energy, imagination, and a commitment to excellence. Succeeding at Fletcher and in life requires sweat and on occasion tears. It also requires empathy, open-mindedness, and you have to have the courage of your convictions, but also be prepared to see the world through the eyes of others and to change your minds when you're wrong. That's the educational environment that you're entering here at the Fletcher School. In addition to marking the start of the academic year, convocation is also an occasion when the dean reports briefly, you will be pleased to hear, on the state of the school. So let me highlight a few developments of the past year that 
illustrate the richness of the Flexure experience that you're all embarking on. First, we launched our new online Master of Global Business Administration degree just this May, and enrollment in that degree has exceeded expectations. Okay? It's the first Tufts program uh, that is on, coming online with 2U, which is our educational technology, technology partner in this venture. Uh, just at the end of last year, the faculty approved a new joint degree program with the Computer Science Department at the School of Engineering on Cybersecurity and Policy, policy and that will launch next September. Our Center on International Law and Governance, just established last year, was inaugurated at the beginning of the year with a conference on protecting civilian institutions and infrastructure from cyber operations. We hired two outstanding new faculty members, both of whom are here. Uh, one is Assistant Professor of Cybersecurity Policy, Josephine Wolf. Josephine, are you here? Where's Josephine? Josephine is here. Um, her expertise includes international internet governance, the security responsibilities of online intermediaries, and the legal, political, and economic consequences of cybersecurity incidents. Uh, her book, which was published in 2018, is called You'll See This Message When It's Too Late, The Legal and Economic Aftermath of Cybersecurity Breaches. Um, we also welcome into the midst of the faculty, Professor of Practice in International Security Studies, Abigail Lennington. Abby, are you here? Abby's right beside Josephine. Welcome, Abby. Her most recent assignment was Special Assistant and Chair of the Action Group for the Chairman of the U.S. Joint Chiefs of Staff. Dr. Lennington holds Master's and Doctoral degrees from the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, and among other things, is taught at West Point. She's a recipient of the Tufts Alumni Distinguished Achievement Award. So welcome to both Abby and Josephine. <laughs> Our faculty continue to produce outstanding research. Notable book pub books published in the last year, include Sulman Khan, uh, I guess I won't name the books, but the authors, Sulman Khan, Tom Dannenbaum, Hurst Hannum, Kelly Sims Gallagher, many others. Um, Policy-oriented research in several of our centers has attracted considerable attention. Time doesn't permit me to run down all of them, but let me name just one. The Center for Strategic Studies, led by Professor Monica Toft, is building, analyzing, and sharing a unique comprehensive data set of all U.S. military interventions from 1776 to 2017, called the Military Intervention Project. Our students were recognized in international, national, and local competitions. Fourteen graduating students were selected as Presidential Management Fellows. Nine Fletcher students received Boren National Security Fellowships to study less commonly taught languages in world regions critical to U.S. interests. Only one other institution had more than the Fletcher School. A four-person team from our MIB program was one of just 12 selected from 50 nations that advanced to the semifinals of the Morgan Stanley Sustainable Investing Challenge in Hong Kong. And Fletcher students won all three prizes in the social track of the Tufts $100,000 New Ventures competition. Okay. We had several hundred speakers here last year. Yes, several hundred. Um, there's no shortage of interesting speakers at Fletcher. Uh, that included, of course, Susan Rice, former U.S. Ambassador to the U.N. and President Barack Obama's National Security Advisor. Uh, she was our commencement speaker last year. Another was Juan Manuel Santos, former President of Colombia, recipient of the 2016 Nobel Peace Prize, and was a Fletcher Fulbright Fellow in 1981. And finally, and importantly for all of us, we managed to balance our budgets and exceed our fundraising goals. So. <laughs> Very good. so these are just a few highlights of the strength of this marvelous institution, a marvelous institution because of the contributors of all of you, faculty, administrators, members of the board, and of course, students. 
This fall, we have once again enrolled an outstanding class of new students in our residential degree programs. Today, we officially welcome 240 talented and carefully selected individuals into the Fletcher community. Our entering students, average age of 27 years, come from nearly 40 countries with diverse accomplishments and aspirations, all united by a common sense of purpose. Our strategic plan speaks of preparing future leaders to know the world. 85 years ago, Fletcher determined that knowing the world could be accomplished by offering a grand total of 12 courses. Today, we offer 170 courses on every aspect of international politics, economics, history, law, and business, and it's still not enough. But we're confident that if, we, if you apply your minds and open your hearts, you will leave here equipped to address the many political, economic, and humanitarian challenges of our time. And so we begin this new academic year with confidence and with enthusiasm. The state of the Fletcher School is strong. Our mission is more relevant than ever. Now to the prizes. Each year, the Alfred P. Rubin Prize is presented to a rising second year student who, through his or her academic performance in international law, best exemplifies the tradition of excellence and scholarship that we associate with Professor Rubin. Professor Al Rubin was known and admired around the world as a first-rate scholar and as a leading proponent of an approach that examines international law within the turbulent social setting of international relations. He was also a great teacher who educated many generations of Fletcher students and faculty to think clearly and soberly about the structure and the effects of international law. I remember him best for a simple but deceptively powerful question he would ask of his students, who decides? In international affairs, most legal disputes between states are not settled in courts. Okay? And if they're not settled in courts, then who does decide? The simplest answer is the states themselves decide, but doesn't that mean that states are the judges and juries and executioners in their own case? And if that's true, doesn't that mean that international law is essentially meaningless? Okay? Well, those are the sorts of questions that Professor Rubin asked students to scratch their heads about for two years or more, and it's caused all of us to scratch our heads as well. So we're indebted to Professor Al Rubin. Um, this prize is made possible by the generous support of Professor Rubin's students and colleagues. It honors his efforts and the efforts of the recipients. This year, the law faculty voted to recognize two students. I would like to call Benjamin Johnson and Austin Shiner down to receive the Alfred P. Rubin Prize for Academic Performance in International Law. Our faculty have long been noted for their impactful research. An outcome of our strategic planning was the creation of an annual award to honor a member of the faculty in recognition of his or her outstanding work. The decision is made by the members of the Academic Council, which is a group of faculty peers. I'm pleased to announce that Professor Kelly Sims Gallagher, Professor of Energy and Environmental Policy and Director of the Center of International Environment and Resource Policy, is this year's recipient of the Fletcher Faculty. <laughs> The award is for the book that she recently wrote called Titans of the Climate, Explaining Policy Process in the United States and China. This timely and important book has received wide praise. As one prominent review stated, Titans of the Climate provides an ideal introduction for students to global climate policy, US and Chinese policymaking, energy regimes, and international politics. Titans attempts and succeeds admirably in distilling an incredibly complex subject with a vast array of actors in a way that makes it all more understandable. 
Most importantly, it reveals how both powers will navigate their energy and climate competition and cooperation going forward. From June 2014 to September 2015, Professor Gallagher served in the Obama White House as a senior policy advisor in the Office of Science and Technology Policy and as a senior China advisor in the Office of the Special Envoy for Climate Change at the U.S. State Department. Uh, her experiences there had a great impact on the book that she wrote that received such wide praise. She's a member of the Board of Science, Technology, and Public Policy Program at the Belfer Center at Harvard University. She's a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. She's a member of the Executive Committee of the Tyler Prize for Environmental Achievement. And she serves on the board of the Energy Foundation, all while being a teacher and professor. She's a close and loyal friend to all of her colleagues. She's an inspiring mentor to her students, and she's a great citizen of the school, of the university, and of the world. So as a recipient of this year's Faculty Research Award, I'm pleased to invite Professor Kelly Sims Gallagher to come forward and offer remarks on behalf of the faculty. Wow. <laughs> Okay, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much, Ian, not only for presenting this award to me, but for your principled and exceptionally capable leadership over the last year. We have been so <laughs> grateful to have you. And also a warm, warm welcome to Dean Kite, and all of our guests, we're really glad to have you here this afternoon. And to all of our incoming students, uh, I would like to welcome you to Boston. Uh, we at Fletcher not only welcome, but truly celebrate people who come from all walks of life, from all cultures, and from all nations, and we're glad you're here. Yeah, OK. <laughs> So I'm going to start my remarks with a bit of a disclaimer. This speech is going to get a little bit dark, but spoiler alert, I'll end on an inspirational note, I promise. Uh, because I'm here on the day that most of you are launching your careers at the Fletcher School, and while there are indeed incredible challenges facing us today, you are uniquely positioned to rise to meet them. Which is good, because let's face it, we are living in pretty troubling times. Each day brings a fresh example of a world that seems to be going off the rails, whether it's a new instance of blatant disregard for the dignity and rights of people from different countries, ethnicities, races, uh, and identities, or yet another abrogation of important international treaties or alliances, long established norms that seem nearly carved in stone are being willfully upended and global institutions created after the conclusion of World War II are fraying and appear unable to nimbly adapt to the current constellation of powers. The world has certainly done its part to guarantee one thing for all of you at the beginning of your careers in international affairs, provide job security. <laughs> for me, in the middle of my career, as a person who's passionate about avoiding catastrophic climate change, and achieving sustainable prosperity in every nation on Earth, the last couple of years have frankly been pretty tough. When I entered Fletcher as an idealistic master's degree student, we had just seen the first global effort to manage climate change come to fruition uh, with the 1997 Kyoto Protocol. And I could see the flaws in that agreement, but I felt confident that they would be addressed and fixed in short order and climate change might be solved. <laughs> well, it took 18 long years um, to get to Paris. And I'm proud of being, uh, being able to make a contribution uh, to the Paris Agreement by helping to negotiate the US-China joint announcement of 2014, which broke the historic impasse between the two historic major emitters of, uh, of greenhouse gases. 
Well, you all know what happened after that. President Trump announced his intent to withdraw from the Paris Agreement, which he cannot do, by the way, just coincidentally, until November 4th, 2020, which happens to be the day after the next US presidential election. Well, that was the beginning of a painful downward spiral in US climate policy that has literally given me nightmares. So by this summer, I was in pretty dire need of inspiration. And I decided to do some reading, uh, primarily about US history, and how major social achievements of the last 200 years were realized. Think back to some of the most significant challenges of the 19th century, breaking up major corporate conglomerates, the abolition of slavery, and addressing women's electoral disenfranchisement, or the 20th century, recovering from the Great Depression, enduring two world wars, transitioning from dictatorship to democracy in many parts of the world, preventing the Cold War from becoming a third world war, alleviating poverty in developing countries, and establishing global institutions to promote peaceful economic development and coexistence. And here we are in the 21st century, where new challenges have emerged, or past challenges continue to haunt us, including extreme economic inequality, terrorism, extremism, human rights atrocities, rampant wildfires in the Amazon, loss of millions of species, freshwater scarcity, and crazy extreme weather events uh, as a consequence of global climate disruption. So here you sit, as I did some 20 years ago, and, and I stand here in the middle of my career now. The world is pretty overwhelming. And so maybe, like me, you feel a little bit demoralized or paralyzed, unsure of how you can make a difference in such a world. Or perhaps you're fired up, energized, determined, and clear about your path forward. And maybe you don't need the kind of perspective I was craving this summer, but I can almost guarantee that at some point you will. So I want to share what I've learned about how to stay committed to social change when it seems the odds are stacked against you. And needless to say, this is a work in progress. So here's an unsurprising fact. Monumental change takes time. Consider women's suffrage in the United States. The Seneca Falls Convention was in 1848, but the 19th Amendment to the US Constitution guaranteeing women the right to vote did not occur until 1920. That's a span of 72 years. Abolition of slavery um, and voting rights in the United States. The American Bill of Rights was ratified in 1791, and the 15th Amendment to the Constitution providing all men, uh, regardless of, quote, race, color, or previous conditions of servitude, was not ratified until 1870. That's 79 years. And European colonization of Africa, which began around 1880, and held sway until about the 1950s when a number of African countries began to achieve independence, but it still took until almost 1975 for most countries to become independent. Well, that's close to a century. So the average of these three examples is 82 years, and that's longer than any normal human being's entire career. And in all three cases, there's still work to do. So how do you, as a person, as a leader, um, persevere in the face of these long timelines? And the first answer is simple, but not easy. Accept that some problems will, in fact, take your entire career to solve. This fact demands dedication and commitment, but also offers the reward of a career of incredible significance. Second, Learn from history that every great leader has struggled. Reading Doris Kearns Goodwin's Leadership in Turbulent Times this summer helped me understand that personal failures and circumstantial obstacles are something everyone shares. And in fact, they can be overcome, such as when Abraham Lincoln announced his retirement from the Illinois House of Representatives after a single term due to his failure to deliver rural economic development as he had promised. He plunged into the worst depression of his life, uh, near, nearly committed suicide, um, and thankfully emerged determined 
uh, with renewed determination to contribute to the betterment of humankind. So indeed, there's no magic formula for getting through these dismal periods. Uh, but some of the essential ingredients include the willingness to confront your own weaknesses, or at least the ones that stand in your way, renewing dedication to your personal passions, and deliberately taking time to take pleasure in life. And I think family and community can help you do both. For me, identifying inspirational leaders, contemporary and historical, can also provide motivation. I remember a precious conversation with the first female prime minister of Norway, Gro Harlem Brundtland, about her decision to achieve gender parity in her cabinet. Her reaction to my pure astonishment at the time was, well, why not? We're half the population. And that common sense and pragmatic approach to social change still sustains me. Third, experiment boldly. Identify the opportunity that exists, of course, in every crisis, no matter how severe it seems. Some of the most profound challenges faced here in the United States, like the Great Depression or the Civil War, led to the creation of some of the most important social innovations in American history. This process of bringing about fundamental change requires a deep understanding of the problem, substantial experimentation, and the courage to be inventive. Indeed, as Franklin D. Roosevelt was fond of saying, try something. So I applaud all of you who are here at Fletcher today for trying something. Your decision to come to Fletcher points to your optimism and faith that good people can do good in this world. I can say with a lot of experience that Fletcher is a loving and imperfect community that will indeed sustain you and nurture you for the journey ahead. It's also a place to honestly scrutinize yourself and ask three questions. First, how can I contribute to meaningful change? Second, what work do I need to do within myself in order to do so? And third, ask yourself, what will shore me up in moments of doubt? When the problem seems intractable and the challenge is too great, when I am totally hypothetically in my mid-40s and facing leaders who deny the very existence of the problem I've committed my life to solving. <laughs> so, honestly, you are in the perfect place to find the answers to these questions. Fletcher's filled with professors sitting right in front of me who are devoting their lives to helping you gain what you need to accomplish your goals. You have peers who will become friends and will then grow into professional family that will support you through thick and thin. And they will also struggle alongside you, and you will take comfort uh, from that common experience. So in a time when we're confronted by people in power making wrongheaded or misinformed decisions, how lucky are you to be in a community of people who want to do the opposite? How fortunate are you to be among peers and mentors who spend every day committed to making the world better? That's a privilege you have worked hard to get, do not squander it. Enjoy it. Revel in it. And make every hour count. Each of us has at least 82 years worth of work to do, so let's get to it. Thank you, Kelly. Um, now, Ashlyn Donahue is a second year student in our Masters of International Business program. At Fletcher, she's been a teaching assistant for Professor Chakravorty's strategic management course. She's the founder of the Fletcher Design Club. She's a co-founder of the Women in Business Club. And she's been a member of the admissions committee and interviewer of new students, prospective students. Before Fletcher, Ashlyn worked for four and a half years with MyAgro, a nonprofit social prize institution, and spent considerable time in the field in both Senegal and Mali. Ironically, two places I hope to visit in November. So Ashlyn, I'll be listening to your words very carefully and coming to you for advice. So I'd like to now call upon Ashlyn Donahue the, for, uh, from the Fletcher class of 2020 to come and speak, to come forward and speak. Thank you, Ashlyn.
Distinguished faculty, guests, and fellow students, it is an honor to be here with you today. The beginning of this school year brings with it a mix of emotions. Anticipation, excitement, nervousness, fear, however that might be playing out for you, whatever that mix of emotions might look like. We know that it'll soon pass as we get swept up into the rhythm of classes and jobs, extracurriculars, culture nights, the ever-impending capstone, and all of the other things that will fill our time. So before those emotions get buried under that impending mountain of work and life, I am excited to have the chance to share with you some of my uh, reflections on my time here so far and some of the things that I'm thinking about as we move into this upcoming year. I know that many of us considered lots of different options in terms of grad school. Fletcher, going to other schools, not going to grad school at all. But for whatever reason, we all ended up here. And I, for one, at times have questioned whether another path would have been a better fit. But what we have here at Fletcher that I know I wouldn't have found elsewhere is a place where I have felt comfortable exploring and trying completely new things. So instead of intimidating me, it has made me braver. So this has led me to doing things like signing up for a Spartan race last year with the Fletcher team, genuinely not knowing if I would make it through. Uh, I also ended up taking harder classes than I expected just because I was really excited about what I would learn. When I was preparing for today, I talked with a bunch of classmates and friends about their time here at Fletcher so far. Within the huge range of experiences that we've had and that we brought with us, the common thread that seemed to come through was that this is a really good place for many of us to take risks that we didn't think that we would to be brave in ways that we didn't expect, uh, or at least in more ways than we expected. Of course, all of this bravery doesn't mean that we're immune to the challenges that Fletcher uh, and our time in school generally can throw at us. And so people also mentioned, and I absolutely identify with this, feeling lost at some point, or for some of us, a lot of the time. Because, after all, being brave means doing a lot of things that feel new or uncomfortable or not like ourselves or sometimes just plain wrong. I came to Fletcher with a clear idea of what I wanted to do afterward. The plan was a very logical next step based on what I'd been doing and what I was already pretty good at. But, if I was being honest with myself, I wasn't willing to say what I was really hoping to do because I was afraid that it was out of my reach. And it very well might be, but going through last year allowed me to get to the point where I'm willing to try for things that I wouldn't have before. So for me, this experience has meant finding myself able to take more risks instead of doing the easier thing. All of this reminds me of something the writer and historian Rebecca Solnit wrote in Reflecting on Being Lost, which is that to be lost is to be fully present, and to be fully present is to be capable of being in uncertainty and mystery. And what could be more mysterious than preparing your first Jacques case? <laughs> Wondering if that DHP credit you want will fill your requirement, or waiting on the red line, wondering if it'll ever move again, and if so, when? But we know the train will move, 
you will get through Jacques, and we will meet all of our requirements. It's the process of getting there that's totally unclear. And it's the community here that allows us to navigate that collective uncertainty together. Feeling nervous, excited, and scared while we're at it is part of what gets us there. And this is, as it turns out, the right place to explore, to live in the present, and to get a little lost. Thank you. Thank you, Ashley. Uh, in its short history, the Fletcher class of 1947 Memorial Award has become a cornerstone of the school's convocation activities, with the awardee annually delivering the school's convocation address. The award is made to a distinguished living Fletcher graduate for service to the school and advancements of its founding ideals and purposes. To date, 16 graduates of the school have been honored. Their names are on the back cover of your program. The winner of this year's award, Rachel Kite, is a member of the GMAP class of 2002. Before I present the award to Dean Kite and ask her to speak, allow me to say a few more words about this extraordinary individual. She is currently Chief Executive Officer and Special Representative of the UN Secretary General for Sustainable Energy for All, and she's co-chair of UN Energy. She's also global advocate for sustainable development and the UN point person for SDG 7, the goal that calls for access to affordable, reliable, sustainable, and modern energy for all by the year 2030. Prior to her work with the Secretary General, she held a number of leadership roles at the World Bank, most recently as Vice President and Special Envoy for Climate Change, where she was instrumental in developing a groundbreaking strategy during the Paris climate negotiations. Her work helped to bring financial resources, which resulted in a much stronger agreement. Rachel grew up in Eastern England and was the first in her family to graduate university, receiving her undergraduate degree in history and politics from the University of London. She is a recipient of numerous awards for leadership, climate action, and sustainable development and she serves as an advisor to many organizations, foundations, and investment initiatives. She's been a professor of practice in sustainable development here at the Fletcher School since the year 2014. She's married to Dr. Elise Zabel, and together they have two children, Nia and Daniel. Elise and Nia are here with us today. Welcome to both of you. Welcome to the Fletcher family. Daniel is being oriented in New Hampshire uh, at his new school. Um, Rachel names her children as her principal inspiration, but before they came along, Bella Abzug played that role, the firebrand congresswoman from New York with whom she worked early in her career. Abzug implored Rachel to always do the courageous thing. Our future dean often speaks about the courage required to tackle the threat of climate change, the existential threat that intensifies all other global threats. We are indebted to the important work she's doing and we could not be prouder of the courage that Rachel Kite has shown throughout her work and the courage she will undoubtedly show as our new dean. For all of those reasons, I'm delighted to present the Class of 1947 Distinguished Service Award to Rachel Kite and invite her to deliver our convocation address. Dean Ad Interim Johnston, members of the faculty, colleagues from across Tufts University, members of the board, staff, students, especially those of you coming new, and guests, it really is wonderful to be here today. It is a distinct privilege to stand before you as the recipient of the 2019 Class of 1947 Memorial Award. For me, 
as for you, there is a special place in my heart for the Fletcher School. I studied here, as you know, as a member of GMAP Class 02, very special class. Um, I've continued my association uh, as a non-resident professor of practice, and of course, I am beyond excited that I will come here in October as your new dean. Mid-career, I was looking for something, skills and tools to help me make sense of the world and to deepen the effectiveness of my contribution. I felt I needed to be better able to pull all the strands together of economic thought and financial understanding, perspectives on security, law, negotiation, institutions and actors, power and personality, the environment and development. I was in the world, but feeling swamped by it. My time at GMAP coincided with 9-11. It felt like overnight, many certainties were just thrown up in the air. Being at Fletcher, my classmates, as well as the faculty, helped me to master the skills I needed for buoyancy in the swirling eddies of then a fast globalizing world. 18 years on, Globalization has brought good and ill. It has sped past the norms of governance. It has created a permanent news cycle at warp speed and has left a full seventh of the world's population behind in stubborn, absolute poverty. Increasingly rejected, rapacious populism is supplanting global hopes with parochial fears. We have existential threats the climate emergency, cyber threats, and bioweaponry. It is into this world that your Fletcher education now comes, your experience, the contacts, the network that you develop here, and you will and you must put it to use. When I arrive here as dean, there is much that I will want to discuss with you about what leadership looks like and much that I will want to do to support you to be the leaders the world needs you to be and to support the faculty to keep on working with you so productively. So today, I leave that for the future. I want to address you as a proud alum and as someone who for the next three weeks is intensely involved in the knife fight, sorry, the international <laughs> diplomacy, <laughs> to stiffen the spine of today's leaders in response to the climate emergency that Professor Gallagher so eloquently spoke of. The Secretary General has asked leaders to come to the UN on the 23rd of September to a climate action summit, not with speeches, but with plans. So my thoughts are really dominated by the leadership challenge of this moment. But I wanted to go back into my own story to try to talk about that. So the challenge at the moment is that efforts to build economies that meet the needs of everyone and do so without carbon emissions will require us to have the courage to build a future when the past is not reliable as a predictor of it, right? The past will not be the future. That requires leadership. Who leads the utility of the future when we will store energy in our cars and buildings and we completely eat away at the revenue model that we're all used to? Who will care for the land unless we pay farmers to be the stewards of soil? Who is the mayor of the industrial city where steel will have to be recycled and where all emissions will have to be used or captured or stored? Who is the minister of finance when we finally shift the burden of taxation from labor to pollution? And who is the general who protects the long and sophisticated just-in-time supply chains of the global military in a world ravaged by climate impacts and with hundreds of millions of people on the move as their homes turn to deserts and crops fail. But put it differently, because you're here at Fletcher. How can you prepare yourself to be the legislator who will bring forth new regulation for energy systems that embrace decentralization and digitalization, that reward hyper-efficiency and provide reliable, affordable, clean power for all? What do you need to learn to be the CEO of the firm that can optimize nutritional value from the crops that poor people grow and rely upon, and you can get it into farmers' hands quickly. What do you need to concentrate on to become the central bank governor that will make mandatory the carbon footprint disclosure of all firms listed in your jurisdiction along all of their supply chains? And will you be the general that brings into operation the carbon-free fighting forces we will all need? 
In this world, it will be leadership that is the delta between success and failure. Welcome to Fletcher. I entitle my remarks today, Leadership and Learning, because a local boy, John F. Kennedy, said that leadership and learning are indispensable to each other. I'm a newcomer to the area, but I completely agree. Looking back over my career and at the current leadership sweepstakes, there are three observations I really want to make. First, leadership is a contact sport. You can learn the best up close. It matters who you work with and for. I've worked for great men and women, comfortable surrounded by strong-minded and brilliant team members, comfortable synthesizing views and then making decisions. I have worked for brilliant men and women deeply threatened by those around them, eventually ending up with a smaller and a smaller circle, just becoming an echo chamber of only one view, their own. Guess which leaders make lasting change. From this, I have learned that asking the right question of the right people is immensely powerful, and just how hard you have to work to ensure that you are not being fed a daily diet of received wisdom. Go beyond the accepted boundaries of your discipline. Ask great questions. Spend time forming those questions and ask them of all of those who are not normally asked. Recently, have you started using the techniques of design thinking to find ways past stubborn obstacles to progress and collaboration? There are no problems today that don't require collaboration across the public and private sector and civil society. For example, just under three billion people still lack access to the means to cook cleanly today. Their use of traditional biomass, wood, charcoal, animal dung, contributes to dangerous deforestation and accounts for the four million deaths from indoor air pollution every year. The international community's response has too often been to focus on delivering stoves to poor people without answering the question of how are we going to ensure access to affordable and clean fuel? Stove needs to work off something. And still, even today, there are very, very few women in the room to discuss design solutions when this is almost exclusively a women customer base. The development industry, like many other industries, will just keep trying to do the same thing but to do it harder, or to sing the same song but sing it louder. It's called spaghetti against the wall. I found that focusing on the framing of the question, how could we build big markets for affordable clean fuels, and then bringing different people in to start answering that question, often leads to new ideas, fresh collaboration, and a different trajectory forward. My second observation is that an essential component of leadership is failure. Finding time at Fletcher to build the mental space and the resilience you will need to accept failures in your own futures is key. This is the safest space imaginable. The first time I used design thinking was when I was asked, why is there no plan to stop climate change? <laughs> there were plans, but they were manifestly failing. I was asked to go away and come back with the elements of a plan, one that then the World Bank group could implement. I collected a group of people. I'm a girl guide, so I was very well behaved. I went off and <laughs> did as I was told. And I collected a group of people from across the World Bank group, irrespective of rank, discipline, or standing. We walled ourselves off for a few days and asked ourselves what were the least number of most important things that need to get done. Not by the bank group, but by the world. The second stage of the process was to answer the question, in that case, what should the World Bank Group do, if anything, in relation to these issues, including just getting out of the way? Our conclusions were that we should get prices right, we should get finance flowing, we should design, build, and live in cities differently, we should change the way we steward land and feed ourselves, and we should change the way we produce energy. This sounds kind of, so what? But at the time, this menu had never been articulated before in economic terms. It's now a large part of the framework for climate action. The agenda became widely adopted, including uh, and especially through financial institutions, spurring new, spurring new coalitions and political processes that helped deliver the Paris Climate Agreement. 
However, and here's the leadership lesson, closer to home, the team suffered from acute graft versus host disease. We were shut down. The political imperative of 2015 sat uncomfortably with a bureaucracy's longer time frame and self-preservation. I share the story because I had to dig really deep at the time to sort out what I felt was personal failure from what was in some ways inevitable given the circumstances. And now I can look back and see that each member of that team has gone on to do great and in some cases revolutionary things, always asking themselves what are the least number of most important things that need to get done. I learned that success sometimes manifests itself well into the future with a big time delay, but importantly I, lost, I learned to take my own stake out of it. And in a world of a climate emergency where we are constantly trying to force the pace, I have learned from the world of business that we need to test fast, fail fast, and adjust fast. Thirdly, there is never a right time, there is only now. Flublilius Cyrus told us that anyone can hold the hem when the sea is calm. Well, the sea is not calm today. More recently, and also not very far from here, J.K. Galbraith expanded on that. He noted that great leaders have one characteristic in common, the willingness to confront unequivocally the major anxiety of their people in their time. He said that this, and not much else, is the essence of leadership. Well, we're certainly anxious at the moment. Professor Johnston referred to Bella Abzug, the congresswoman from New York. She told me that information will always be imperfect, but you have to develop your decision-making muscle memory. Bella had spent a lifetime breaking down barriers when she sung the Kaddish for her father in their Orthodox synagogue, when she represented African-American clients in the South in the fight for civil rights, or in her work with Wangari Maathai and others to have the women's voices heard in the struggle for more sustainable development. And she did tell me that when there's a fork in the road, stand, think, and do the courageous thing. I'm struck today and inspired today in this climate emergency that we see the leadership coming from those even younger than you, from school children, from middle school students, high school students. They are not bounden by my generation's fear of the new and uncharted territory of a carbon neutral economy. They are excited by its possibility. They don't think in terms of sacrifice, they think in terms of expansion of hope. It was Rabindranath Tagore, the great Bengali poet, an inspirer of other peaceful revolutionaries, that said, don't limit a child to your own learning, for she was born in another. Greta Thunberg has challenged the 16-year-old Swedish climate activist who started the school strikes has challenged the limits of incumbent thinking and in so doing has provoked an extraordinarily hostile and vicious response. We have to understand that that viciousness comes from fear, a fear of the loss of control, a fear of not having answers and having been exposed by a 16 year old girl who stares blankly into the camera and simply asks the obvious question. It's uncomfortable to watch, but it is necessary grounding. I am a work in progress. You are a work in progress. Your lives and careers will be full of twists and turns. Success is not a straight line plotted out on a graph. There will be moments to lead from the front there will be moments to lead from behind. There will be moments to concentrate on the learning that JFK notes is interwoven with leadership. This is that time for you. The world with all its complexities and with such endless and exciting possibilities of solutions just waiting for you to take them, to burnish them and to push them out there into the world. This is an extraordinary place 
You, I have no doubt, are an extraordinary generation. This is your time. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Kite, for confirming what we all knew, which is that the Fletcher School, the Fletcher community, is very, very fortunate that you will be our dean. In closing, let me urge you, our students, to make full use of your time here, as all of us seem to have said. Study hard push yourselves, and learn from each other, and plan for your future. You all need to be concerned about what you do upon graduation, where you will live, and where you will work. But don't ever forget the cautionary words of that great international relations scholar, John Lennon, <laughs> who sings in the song, Beautiful Boy, life is what happens to you while you're busy making other plans. So in making those future plans, please be sure to live life to the fullest while you're here. With that, consider yourselves convoked. <laughs> You are all invited to join Dean Kite, your faculty, and the administrators of the school at a reception outside of the auditorium. Thank you all. <laughs>